So to recap, we did an in-class activity where we collected data from plain and peanut fun size packs of M&Ms, and we asked ourselves the question, could the observed difference in means be due to chance-like variability? We observed an approximate mean for the plain packs of Y bar plain is approximately 16 candies. We also observed an approximate mean for the peanut packs of Y bar peanut of approximately seven candies, and that was true for all three classes. The observed difference in means was y bar plain minus y bar peanut, therefore is approximately nine candies. We also could have done it as y bar peanut minus y bar plain is approximately negative nine candies. That negative matters just as the positive implied in the positive nine matters. It tells us which of those two groups, plain or peanut, had more candies on average. So here, when we do y bar peanut minus y bar plain, y bar plain, it tells us that on average there are nine fewer candies in the plain group than in the peanut group. Just as up here, it tells us that on average there are nine more candies in the plain group than the peanut group. So the sign tells us relatively which group has a higher mean. So the direction of the subtraction is important as well as the sign of the difference. In order to test whether the observed difference could be obser uh, due to just chance like variation or not, we are going to do a two-sample t-test for comparing population means. In class, we saw that any test statistic, any t observed test statistic, is a difference between what we observed, our sample statistic, the hypothesized parameter, and the standard deviation of the statistic. This works out to be this observed difference of means y1 bar and y2 bar minus the hypothesized difference of the true means for those groups. So this is the true mean for group one, and this is the true mean for group two. So once again, that order of the subtraction matters. In the denominator, we have the standard deviation of our sample difference. So this is going to be the standard error of y1 bar minus y2 bar. It works out that this standard error of y1 bar minus y2 bar exists in a nice neat form, and it has some familiar properties. It's the variability of the first group mean plus the variability of the second group mean. If we were only dealing with y bar 1, we would just have the square root of s1 square root over n1, or s1 over the square root of n1. But because we have two groups, we have to add those two groups' variability, because they're both going to contribute to the overall variability of that difference, and that's where we get this overall standard error. So let's think about this. For our class, and I'm going to use the uh, information from our first class, I've got my first class candy data here. I've already stacked the data so that I have one column for the type of data, or for the type of candy, and one column for the response, the count. In order to get the two group sample means and the two group sample standard deviations, I can go to Analyze, Distribution. The type of candy is a categorical explanatory variable, and I want to get an analysis for each group, so the group mean for plain and for peanut and the standard deviation for plain and peanut, so I'm going to put that in my by box. We haven't used this box before, but if I have a categorical explanatory variable and I want to get a separate analysis for each group, so a mean for each group, I'm going to use that for my by. So it's separating out or grouping by the categorical variable. The response still goes in the response box, so I still want the mean of the counts. I'm just going to do that separately for each level of my explanatory variable. Now I can hit OK, and I can see that I have a separate histogram for the peanut candies and the plain candies. 
I'm going to ignore the quantile information for now because that's not really useful information for what we're trying to do. And I can see that on average for peanut candies, we had about seven candies on average for each fun size pack. And for the plain, we see that on average there was about there were about 16 candies for the plain fun size packs, and that's what we had estimated. So if I come back here, we had a T of 15.9 minus seven point, what did we see? 7.15 for my sample mean. So that's Y bar plain minus Y bar peanut. Now, if there really is no association, then my hypothesized difference is zero. The true difference in the means is zero. That on average, I get the same amount for plain as I do for peanut. For this standard error, I do the square root of the variance for group 1 over n1 plus the variance for group 2 over n2. Now my standard, uh, my summary statistics do not provide the variances, but I do get the standard deviations. So for plain, the standard deviation is 1.06, and for peanut, the standard deviation is 0.77, and they have the same sample size, 32. So I want 1.06 squared over 32 and 0.77 squared over 32. So 1.06 squared over 32 plus 0.77 squared over 32. I've taken the standard deviation from group 1 and squared it, and I divided by the sample size for group 1. That would be plain. I took the standard deviation for peanut, squared it, and divided by the sample size for peanut. When I pull all this together, all that together, I get 37.78. And that's what we saw in class. This means that if there is no difference between the true mean number of candies in plain and peanut fun size packs, we observed a sample difference 37.8 standard errors above what we would expect. And that's unusual. This is really, really big for a t-test statistic. Normally, we like to think of t-test statistics between plus or minus three, and this is well beyond that scope. So, when this null hypothesis is true, so when there is no difference between the true mean number of candies for these two groups, plain and peanut, the two sample t test statistic has an approximately t distribution. What are the degrees of freedom? Well, I'm going to give you an out. This is going to come from the software. If we can make some assumptions, it's a pretty easy thing to find. But when we don't satisfy those assumptions, which more than often happens, we're going to use a really complex formula called the Welsh Satterthwaite approximation. And that gives us a non-whole number. And if you try to plug in a non-whole number into a t-distribution calculator, it's going to say, what are you doing? You have to have whole number degrees of freedom. Um, so to learn more about this or to see what this is, you can see the footnote on page 463 of the text. And once you see that footnote and you see what the formula is, you're going to be like, Thank you, Dr. Megan, for not making us calculate this and just letting it get, let, just letting us get these degrees of freedom from the software. Jump will calculate this automatically for us, and then we don't have to worry about it. So, yay! So that's a really quick recap. So we've observed this um, t-test statistic. It's really, really large. Our sample difference is 37.78 standard errors above the hypothesized value. Um, what do we do with that? 
Well, we're going to use our two sample t-tests to decide if this observed difference is compatible with a difference in the true mean scores. That is, if we have strong evidence against that null hypothesis. Well, to do that, we have to check our conditions. So the first off, we have to check what kind of variables we have. We need to have a quantitative response in order to be able to talk about a mean response in the first place. And we have to have a categorical explanatory variable. If we don't have a categorical explanatory variable, then we can't talk about groups. If we had a quantitative explanatory variable, then we would be doing regression. We also have to have independent samples. What does that mean? It means that the peanut sample and the plain sample don't influence what's going on with one another. So that when I sample plain packets, that doesn't affect the amount of candies in the peanut packets. And when I sample the peanut packets, that doesn't influence what's going on in the plain packets. So my peanut sample and my plain sample are independent. Practically speaking, there is no overlap in the samples. So that a plain packet cannot also be a peanut packet, and a peanut packet cannot also be a plain packet. If we're not thinking about candies, we might say that we're comparing um, people at different universities. So if you are enrolled at the University of Georgia, you cannot also be enrolled at Georgia Tech. And if you're enrolled at Georgia Tech, you cannot also be enrolled at the University of Georgia. So that would make these independent samples. The students at UGA are not also students at Georgia Tech and vice versa. They're independent samples because there is no overlap in those samples. We need random samples. That means that both samples, the peanut sample and the plain sample, are representative of their respective populations. That means we did not systematically sample just the largest plain packets and systematically uh, sample the smallest peanut packets, right? We took a random sample from the peanut bag and we took a random sample of the plain bag. So we have a random sample from both populations because there are two distinct populations, the plain population and the peanut population. We have to have approximate normal distribution of the response for all levels of the explanatory variable. That just means the number of candies must be normal for both peanut and plain candies. How do we check that? Well, in regression, we looked at a histogram of the residuals because the residuals accounted for the response after we used the explanatory variable to predict. When we have a categorical predictor, we look at a histogram of the response for each group. And we've actually already generated that. Here, I have a histogram of the response for peanut candies. And the second plot is a histogram of the response for plain candies. So for the first level of the explanatory variable for peanut candies, does it seem reasonable that we have a unimodal and symmetric distribution? It looks unimodal, but it does not look very symmetric. So maybe it's violated but we also remember that the t distribution is robust to small departures from normality. So this does not seem like a gross violation, so we can probably use the t distribution and still get valid results. For the second, it definitely looks unimodal and symmetric. The distribution of the response for the plain candies is certainly unimodal and approximately symmetric. So because both of these conditions, because both of the levels of the explanatory variable yield an approximately unimodal and not 
two asymmetric results, we can safely use that t-distribution. So we check this using a histogram of the response for each level of the categorical predictor. And those are all of our conditions. So now we can check our hypotheses. The null hypothesis is that mu1 minus mu2, or mu plane minus mu peanut, equals zero. The alternative hypothesis is that mu plane minus mu peanut is not equal to zero, that there is a difference in that true mean response. And of course, we define our parameters. We did this in class. Mu plane and mu peanut are respectively the true mean number of candies in plain and peanut M&M fun size packs. We have our test statistic, T obs is, we found it to be 37.78. We need our p-value. To get our p-value, we can do analyze fit y by x. So I come back to jump. I have my explanatory variable and my response. So I go to analyze fit y by x. The count is my response. The type of candy is my explanatory variable. Graphically, it looks like there does seem to be a difference in the mean response. So I do my t-test. Based on this, I see that my p-value for the two-tailed test, so the probability that it's greater than the absolute value of t, is less than 0 0.0001. This p-value means that if there is no difference in true mean number of candies for plain and peanut fun size packs. We would expect to see something like this less than 0.01% of the time. I should say, we should expect to see something like this, something like this, or more extreme, less than 0.01% of the time. That's pretty unusual. Our data are compatible with a difference in means. There is strong evidence of a relationship between type of candy and the amount of candy you get. as long as it comes to plain versus peanut uh, M&Ms and the amount of candy. We haven't compared all possible types of candies, such as Skittles or even other types of M&Ms. But this is a good, solid first start.